Okay, good morning. We're continuing with Rabbi Shtaif's Mitzvah Hashem, Dine Ben Noach, the laws of Ne Noach. And uh, we're here on page 305, Shin Hei, paragraph Tezayin, paragraph 16. The Savior Bezrahi, Parshish Meis, Chidish, Sheben Neach, Shalom Nemar, by Haposik, Bahai Bahim. Sayh Lakayim, and Mitzvah Shaloy, a filo of Makam Sakana. That the non Jewish person, the son of Noach, is here's the here's let's bring a little background. So um in Parshas Vaikra in chapter 18, verse 5, it says that you should live in them. Now, the actual simple meaning of the verse is, is very uh, as in every verse is significant. You have to always stick to the simple meaning of the verse. The simple meaning of the verse is it's coming in connection with a, a it's the preamble to the uh, warning against all the forbidden relations. And in that chapter, there's a, so to speak, a, God speaks and says that don't follow the ways, the evil ways of the nations around you. And, um, and you will live in them, meaning to say you're going to receive uh, goodness in the world to come. So then it continues right after that, it starts to list one after the other, all the forbidden relations. So the words of Chaibahim are brought down in the Gemara in response to the following question. Is a person allowed, a Jewish person who is commanded not to desecrate the Shabbos, he has to guard the Shabbos. So there's a, uh, one of the rules in, um, one of the forbidden labors is grinding things because that's part of the pre preparation of um, items for the temple service. And that's one of the 39 forbidden labors. How do you make medications? You make medications by grinding things. So you make, take this, something of this, something of that, and you grind it. And so therefore the sages said that you cannot, so obviously you cannot grind medication for Shab, uh, on Shabbos. There's actually, generally speaking, a um, preventative fence around the possibility of a person coming to grind items to make uh, some sort of medication or potion of, of uh, items, whether it's uh, herbs or it's going to be some sort of chemicals, whatever it is, all involves grinding. To make a paste, um, you have these different um, uh, medications are made into pastes or ground and then put into liquids, or people make medications, they make paste and then they apply it on the skin, uh, like a salve. There's that everything involves <clears throat> grinding. So the sages said that you're not, person's not allowed to take medication on Shabbos because they're going to come to grind something in order to prepare this medication or this application, whatever you want to call it. They're going to come to grind something. And it makes that makes perfect sense because um, most people are not stocking in their cabinet. Uh, medications that they need, they are going to now have to repair them because especially if it's something made of fresh items, you're going to take your garlic. If you're going to take uh, onion or oregano, whatever it is, you're going to grind it up. You're going to, no one's sitting around with a, a two-year-old supply, a shelf-stable garlic um, paste, something that you're going to prepare today. So there's a general exception, which is that let's say a person is taking something on a long-term basis. So if a person's, you know, every day taking the medication, so they have this supply prepared, then there could be an exception there. But so the general rule is you can't do these things on Shabbos. But what happens if a person is going to die as a result of, let's say, if this medication is necessary to save him right now. Doctor comes along and says, has to take this. He needs this. This uh, compound needs to be mixed together. And uh, the person is going to die without it. So sh according to the rules of Shabbos, the halachas of Shabbos, you can't prepare medication. The doctor is saying the person is going to die. So the question is, can you save this person's life by violating one of the rules of Shabbos? And the answer is the, the, that yes, you can um, violate the Shabbos. And the concept is you violate one Shabbos in order that this person should live for many Shabbosim, he should live for many future 
Shabbos is by the fact that you're going to violate this one Shabbos, you're going to grind this, you do this forbidden labor, and by extension, you could then learn from that. Okay, so if you could, if you could, um, um, vi- if you could uh, violate the Shabbos by grinding up the paste or the medication, uh, then you could drive your the Jewish person could drive his car in Shabbos to save his life or to save his, someone else's life. He could, uh, you could plug in a heart monitor. You could do all kinds of things that would be related to a life and death situation can be done on Shabbos. Based on the idea, now, so this is the concept. You're going to save the Shabbos. You're going to save this person's life. You're, he's going to now live for future Shabbos. What's, when, a, uh, the Chachami, when the sages are going to say something, they want to have a source, a place to point to, to give a, a basis, a reliance for their position. So in the Gemara, it's brought down. Shmuel says, one of the great sages says, my, my evidence for what I have to say, my Torah evidence, is the verse that says, behem, and you shall live in them. So he is actually taking the verse to mean the a sort of an opposite application. Let's, but let's see what, what, it, he, what he says it means. He says the verse means, says, you will live in them. When you keep my statutes and my uh, laws, then you will, the, the, the simple meaning of the verse is you will live in them, meaning to say, don't worry about the fact that you're giving up some pleasures in this world because you're not involved in all these forbidden uh, acts, uh, in, in, you know, relationship, intimate activities. Don't worry about that because you're going to get life. You're going to get life by keeping my commandments. You're going to get life, eternal life. So comes along Shmuel and he says, I want to learn this to mean that if you keep my commandments, that you should live while you're keeping my commandments. Meaning to say, don't do my commandments in a way that you're going to die from it. In, so he's, he's, com- he's, not, he's not contradicting. He can't contradict the simple meaning of the verse. The simple meaning of the verse uh, applies. But the, um, the, his, 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 uh, his way of, of finding like a, something to rely on, to, an illusion, something that's alluding to what he's saying, that, to this concept that you should violate one Shabbos in order to um, um, observe other Shabbos, is that if the sh- observance of Shabbos and, and keeping to this rule of not making medication, not grinding things is going to lead to a person to die. That's the opposite of God's intent. And he's saying, you should live in my key ke- in keeping my statutes and in keeping my decrees. So in reality, this is in a certain sense, an opposite conclusion from the original, the simple meaning, because the simple meaning is saying that you are, it's first of all, it's talking about life in the afterlife. It's talking about an eternal life, right? And second of all, it's saying that strictly observe my commandments and you will live. Even if you want to say it, it refers to some sort of physical life in this world and you will live in them, you would say that it means by, by refraining from all these forbidden sexual relations, a person is going to have a better of a high behem. You're going to be a fully alive by not doing these things. So in the moment, you're going to think that if you go and, and do something that appe- looks appealing in the moment, you should know that if you refrain from it, you keep my observances, my, my, my statutes and my, my commands, God is saying, you're going to live a really good life in this world and the world to come. So it's saying strict observance is going to bring you life. Shmuel in the, in the Talmud is saying, um, in, in a certain sense, an opposite position. He's saying not not in relation to the the um, the God forbid and to the to the what it's saying in the verse, but he's using it to come to almost in a certain sense an opposite application. He's saying if you violate my Shabbos in order to save a life, that you could you could rely on this v'chayim, you will live. So therefore, it's the, the the need to live is coming to say you could violate the Shabbos, which is a is a very Shabbos is a central commandment of the Torah because it's relating to the testimony and the, um, the, the testimony that God Almighty created the world in six days and rest in the seventh. So this is, this is a fundamental part of belief in God Almighty. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a technicality over here 
to violate the Shabbos and say, okay, I'm going to start grinding. That's something that's an absolutely essential part of, of the belief in God Almighty. So I'll just make a point over here while we're on the subject, because this is a verse that was then taken in more recent times completely out of context. Because what will happen is a person could start to abuse this and they could start to extend it beyond its original intention. Shmuel's intention is a situation. You have a person who needs right now is an immediate life and death situation. And if you don't violate the Shabbos for him, he will die. Okay. Now you could take it one step further and say, there's a good possibility. You have a doubt that he might die. Even a slightly, maybe it's a little more remote possibility. We'll, we'll violate the Shabbos because we don't want to come close to him dying. But then you could take it further and further. You could say, oh, one second here. And, and there's a, a sage from the previous generation, that, the Chazan, Chazan Ish. He writes as follows. You have to be careful with this, this thinking. Because you might say, listen, he was speaking about the fact that many Jewish people were keeping their businesses open on Shabbos, which is a forbidden, you're not allowed to do business on Shabbos. So he said, people are going to make a false argument. They're going to say, if, I don't, if a person doesn't keep his business open on Shabbos, he's not going to be able to make a living. He's not going to have enough income. Then he won't have food. Then he, if he doesn't eat food, he's going to die. So therefore, since it says you will live in them, and you're not, the, 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 the commandments are supposed to bring you to more life, not to death. So therefore, uh, it's okay to keep his business open on Shabbos because it's pekoch nefesh. It's, it's life-threatening. That he's going to, if he closes the business on Shabbos, he says, no, that's false. That's a false argumentation. You're taking all of this way out of context. The Chaybahem, the idea that for saving a life, you could violate the Shabbos is talking about a very specific situation with immediate results uh, or, and very, or possibility of immediate results. Meaning, say that the guy is lying there. Could, you, could he survive for another six hours and, and he's having a heart attack? Okay, there's a good chance a person could survive a heart attack for six hours. That Many people survive heart attacks, but you don't know. So in that case, you could rush him to the hospital or, or you could prepare whatever he needs, type of medications that would help uh, regulate his heartbeat, let's say, or, or restore it or whatever it is. Okay, so what do they do when the public health warriors are thinking about how they're going to try to attack and sabotage Judaism and get the Jewish people to be fooled into um, abandoning Jewish belief and Jewish practice. You, the only way to do that is to attack it from within. So to come along with an argument that's based on a real Torah source, but then that's taken completely out of context, but sounds so good that a person can't really think clearly anymore. So they come along and they say, okay, there's something in the air in March 2020. There's something in the air. It's very dangerous. The only thing to do is to keep everyone home. No, just cancel all gatherings, all synagogues, all these shivas, all Torah learning, all family gatherings, all myth commandments of visit the sick, bury the dead. All these commandments were all of a sudden, boom, no more. Why? Because it says, you can't do something. If it's going to lead to your death, right? There's three general commandments that a person, a Jewish person, we learned last week, a Jewish person is obligated to give up his life, um, to not transgress, excuse me, murder, uh, sexual immorality, and um, and he's not allowed to do that. There's three things, and, and stealing. He can't murder, he can't be immoral, and he can't steal. These are things... Uh, that he's he's for i'm oh, sorry not stealing of um the three things are worshiping idols murder and sexual immorality those he cannot violate to save his life but everything else he could um he could uh he could you know to if it's necessary to take make a medication he could do that to save his life on shabbos he could drive his wife's giving birth he could drive to the hospital could call an ambulance Okay, so they say, okay, well, since there's this danger in the air, and if you go to the synagogue, person, everyone's going to die, or there's a chance that everyone's going to die, or a chance that even one person might die, then, and even though the chance is remote, because you don't know that anyone in the synagogue actually has this, 
deadly, what they're calling a deadly uh, contagion. So um, therefore they say, v'chayvahem, look, it says right here, live in it, don't die in it. So don't do any Jewish practices that could possibly even remotely lead to your death. Okay, so the reason I'm bringing all this to your attention is because you have to understand, you have to learn these things in the original sources, because once you, once you start to learn the original verse in its original with its original meaning, you'd see how um, absolutely false that argument is. Because first of all, the, let's go back to the verse. The verse is about not being immoral. It's, not a, it's about not leaving the practices of Judaism and Torah in order to try to have an experience in this world. So first of all, the, the real meaning of the verse and the simple meaning is it has to be forefront of your mind. And if you look in the commentaries, they're saying that things that are related to the essential practices of Judaism are especially susceptible to attack from the outside. So therefore you have to be especially, if you look at the whole verse in context, you have to be especially careful about my my decrees and my my um, laws, says God Almighty, because these are things that are, are being attacked. So once you would read that and understand that, you would realize, hmm, this is kind of strange that they're trying to use this very verse that in the outside its meaning. Second of all, even according to what Shmuel is saying in the Gemara, that you should take um, measures to make sure you stay alive, even if it's at the expense of violating temporarily a a um, a commandment, uh, other than the, the three that I mentioned. Then, um, then that's only referring to specific situations. And there's a certain standard. It has to be a that you know that the person is really life and death ill, or or has a really strong possibility. This person right now, not the possibility that maybe if he goes to the synagogue, maybe he's going to catch something which maybe something blah, 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 which which has a, a, a very small chance of even hurting him. Number two is it has to be that you know you have a solution. That the solution that you're saying is going to actually bring the result. You can't make a medication for a person on Shabbos if you don't know that it's going to work, right? So let's say we said we could we could um, violate the Shabbos to, in order to make a medication. So um, let's say I'm, I'm not a trained uh, health professional, you know, healer. I have no idea about the subject. I never even saw the disease. And I say, I think that we should take um, this thing and we should mix it up and we should grind it up. But I have no track record of healing with this i never don't know that it works there's no general reputation that this thing works you can't do that you cannot grind that up to save the person's life on shabbos because it has doesn't meet the criteria for being something that we know it's going to work or it has a very good chance to work so you have to either have expert uh people with experience when we say expert we mean actual experience not theoretical expertise but actual experience that say i know that this works or it's generally known in the human population that this thing is um, is going to work. Okay, so then you could take the that you could make the effort and and, and violate the Shabbos. So, anyways, the whole concept over here is being taken completely out of uh, completely out of context. But what it does is it's a it's a it's a slogan. It's a um, sound bite that sounds really good. Oh no, you got to be careful because the Torah says live in them and going to synagogue or going to yeshiva could lead to death. So therefore nullify all prayer in public, nullify all synagogue services, nullify all yeshiva. And people actually bought this. And many distinguished rabbis issued decrees based on this. So we have to, be, we have to understand, this is the importance of learning Torah, is you cannot rely on other people to tell you what the Torah says. You have to open it up yourself and you have to read it. You have to say, one second, what does it say over here? What's the context of the original verse? What Shmuel is saying, the reason I point out that what Shmuel is saying is actually an opposite of what the verse is saying in the sense that he's, the verse is saying, keep my laws stringently, be extra careful with my laws, don't, don't even compromise on the smallest amount, and you will live in them. So Shmuel is coming and saying, and you, live, you will live in them, is coming to say, you can violate one of my laws. Why it's so important to see that is because he's not, his, his, the reason for being able to violate the Shabbos in order to save a person's life is is not based strictly on this verse it's a reliance that he has an illusion that he wants to say you want to i'll have i have a way to to help you feel okay with violating the shabbos to save a life and i'm going to cite this verse but you so if you and the, and we the, uh, the the sages agree with this and we have the laws of shabbos include 
chapters on when and under what conditions you could do what to save a, hu a human life. But you have to understand that, that, that Shmuel was not opening up a license to then come and undermine and dismantle the entire Judaism. He didn't come and say you could change the entire way of life to fulfill the, um, the, the, the decrees and the instructions of the people that are coming to create a whole crisis in order to shut down humanity. That's not what he was saying. So that's why it's so important to be, you have to always be thinking and you cannot, it, so as a non-Jew, non-Jew is going to say to himself, one second, here I am, here's a non-Jew that he's, he's, he's learning the Torah, he's accepting that God Almighty gave the Torah Mount Sinai and he gave it to the Jewish people and Moses, our teacher, and here's a rabbi who's a, um, a successor to Moses, meaning he learned Moses' Torah and he he has uh, smicha, he has rabbinical ordination that's passed down from generation to generation. And you have a non-Jew that's going to say, one second, compared to him, compared to this rabbi who's been studying Torah for, for decades, maybe the rabbi is 75 years old. He's been studying Torah since he's five years old, 70 years of Torah study. And the non-Jew says, I, he doesn't understand Hebrew to himself. He doesn't understand Hebrew. He, he barely um, is just learning these concepts. How can he... Uh, possibly have anything to say on any subject compared to the 75-year-old Torah scholar. So the answer is, and what we learned already, that Nanju from the Marama Fano, Nanju has a mitzvah, is a commandment to learn the Torah that applies to him. It's a positive commandment, one of the 30 commandments brought down in the, in the Gemara and Chul, and he has an obligation to learn. The way we learn is by asking questions. So you have to say, one second, does this make sense? What is the original? So you only learn it in English. You can only learn it in German or Spanish, or whatever. One second. What's the context of this verse over here? What is the verse really saying? Um, I had better. I better look at this now. What they're doing is they're using this verse. I used to look around. You see, they're using the verse to completely demolish all the basic principles of Judaism. Hmm. Does that make sense? Now you might not know anything. You think, but you. Your common sense is still there. God, where's the common sense come from? It comes from God Almighty. And God Almighty gives you the ability to have the, the, the ability and insight to be able to look into the Torah and to be able to understand what the simple meaning is. And, and the more you learn, you can go beyond the simple meaning. But, but this you, it still has to make sense. And it cannot, you cannot violate the simple meaning of the verse. You can't take a limited exception that's a, 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 an, an illusion to, to the idea of staying alive by violating the Shabbos and then turn it into a whole demolition charge to try to un, you know, take away the, the Torah from all of humanity. So that's just, I want to just digress there to talk about this Zahai Behem so you can understand the context of this. First of all, it's, it, it gives us an understanding of the what that's coming, what we're going to learn right now. And the question is whether this verse now, this concept, the Chayvahem, applies to a non-Jewish person. Okay, so let's look inside what he says over here. So the Sefer Mizrahi, Parsha Shmeis, Chida, she comes up with an innovative thought in this book of Mizrahi. That the Ben Neach non Jew, that it doesn't say by the non Jews the verse, and you will live in them. So he has to fulfill his commandments even in a place of danger. So, what that means, a Jewish person would be exempt from fulfilling his mitzvah. Again, it's not, it doesn't apply to all mitzvahs, but in, in the concept we're talking about over here. So his mitzvah is don't make medication. So he's allowed not to fulfill that mitzvah in order to avoid the danger, right? If you have, if we have a danger that we, and we have to understand, is it a danger? Is it a certain danger? How great is the danger and so forth? But let's just keep it simple here. So an, a Jewish person, he would be forbidden to make to, to, to if if the, if he's in life and death danger and the way to solve his life and death danger is to make the medication then it'd be forbidden for him to refrain from that because he has an obligation to stay alive which would supersede his obligation to keep the shabbos 
But the, here it's saying that the non-Jew has to fulfill his commandment even though it might bring him to danger. Okay? It doesn't bring an example over here. And I don't want to um, venture an example because when you come into an example, you, you have many complications with other factors to consider. Now, Shabbos, the guardian of the Shabbos is not something that applies to a non-Jew. So our examples, the easiest examples of whether or not a person is obligated to, um, to violate the commandment in order to save his life, um, the easiest examples are in Shabbos. So, um, so it's, I can't bring those examples because they're not don't apply to a non-Jew who doesn't have an obligation to keep the Shabbos. So we're a little bit. I'm not bringing an example over here. So maybe if uh, you know of one, if you think of one, we could uh, discuss it. But in general, so. Um, so, so, saying this. so therefore, a non-Jew has to, um, he has to fulfill his commandment and he can't say, oh, um, so this is dangerous. I get to be exempted from this because the, the, pus, the verse that him, that you will live in them was not given to the non-Jew in the first place. So he doesn't have the obligation to supersede, put his life first ahead of keeping the commandments. He has to keep the commandment even at the expense of his life. Um, only, then he says, only if there, he's being forced. We said before, he's being forced, he's being pressured, is a better word, because no one's forced to do anything. We all have choice. If he's being pressured to do the transgression, then he doesn't have to um, give up his life for it. For, for staying away from the transgression. So we said before, in the, in the previous week, we discussed that a, um, whereas a Jew has an obligation, so it's actually, it's, we're going in the, the inverse over here. A Jew has an obligation to give up his uh, life so as not to transgress one of these commandments, even the three commandments. A non-Jew doesn't have that obligation. So if someone says to him, bow down to worship idols, so if he was a Jewish person, he has to give up his life and get killed. The non-Jewish person could bow down to the idol and stay alive. But then when we come here to, um, to the question of with no pressure, it's just can he do this thing that if he does it, it's gonna might put him in a place of danger at his life at risk if he can, fulfills his commandment, but it's not because of someone threatening him. Then he actually, the Jewish person can be exempted from doing the thing that's going to put him in danger, while the non-Jewish person is not exempted. So, then, therefore, so he says in parentheses, this is why Moshe Rabbeinu was uh, punished. We're going to, um, we're going to, um, circumcise, to circumcise and go on the way on starting to travel, this is a danger for the child. Because a gamba makam sakana tzayh l'kayam mitzvah. So here's the situation. So Moses is going to circumcise. This is before the Torah is given on Mount Sinai. So that everyone is considered like a ben neyach. That even though the Jewish people, meaning to say Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had the Torah, that they had received from Shem Ben Nayach. We learned this already. The Torah was already given, but it wasn't applicable to everybody. To, to the, and the, but a, Abraham had come along and said, Abraham, our father, came along and said, I want the entire Torah. I want to take on the responsibility for this. So he personally was keeping all the commandments that are in the Torah, including what we call the rabbinic commandments, the rabbinic instructions, right? But still his classification was not as, from a legal perspective, was not as a Jew. His classification was as a ben Noyach, as a son of Noyach, because the class, legal classification of a Jew, even though there was the family of the Jews, meaning to say Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, his, and their children, but they weren't legally obligated in all the commandments that were later on given to Mount Sinai, even though they knew them and they kept them. So an example is that... Um, um, Yaakov 
married two sisters. He was because of, uh, Ben Noyah could marry two sisters, but um, it, and Jew cannot. So he was actually he received consequences for marrying two sisters, even though he was he shouldn't have done it because even though legally he was still a Ben Noyah, he wasn't yet in the legal category of a Jew after Mount Sinai. But see, he was he should have known not to do it. But you know what? Whether he was stuck in that situation where he was wanted to marry one and love and tricked him and gave him the sister, Leah. So therefore, we see that there's the distinctions between what is right, what should have been done according to the highest, according to the Torah, applies to Jews, and what he was legally allowed because he wasn't yet in the legal category of a Jew. So why is this relevant here? Because Moses is going, it has to circumcise his son. That's something that was commanded to Abraham and his descendants. Okay, that was a specific commandment. The rest of the Torah had not been given, but there were certain specific commandments. So not, for example, Abraham was commanded, commanded not to, uh, to, to circumcise his, himself and his children and his offspring and his servants. And Jacob, and since the time of Jacob, Jewish people did not eat the Gidonosha, the, the sinew, the, the vein, or the sinew of the, the um, tendon in the back of the, of the leg, I guess the sciatica. So there were certain commandments that did apply to this family. So Moses has a commandment to circumcise his son. But he doesn't. And what's his rationale? He's about to take his children on this journey to Egypt. And you, it's, circumcision is still a, 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 um, the person's in a certain level of danger afterwards and to go traveling while a person's recovering from an operation is 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 endangering the person person like it you know you go to a doctor he says you must rest in bed for x number of days that means that going out of bed and starting to walk around and tra especially traveling which is draining and and could um impact the let's say the area of this the bris mila, the circumcision is going to be impacted by sitting on a camel or a horse, donkey or a horse whatever it is um, uh, it's going to be dangerous. It's going to could open the wound. It could cause bleeding, so forth. So it's a danger. So Mo Moses says to himself, um, he says, "Listen, I have an obligation to uh, circumcise my son. But if I circumcise my son and they go in out in the road on traveling, I'm putting him in danger. So I'm exempted since we learned v'chay behem." We learn that you're exempted from a commandment that is going to lead to for a Jew is is exempted from a commandment that's going to lead to him to put him in danger. So Moses says, therefore, he's exempted from this commandment of circumcising his son because it's going to put him in danger. Because the trip is, he's not going to put off the trip. He's going to do the trip. That's a separate question. How why he had to do that trip that day. And, and couldn't circumcise it, all kinds of other questions to ask. But right now, the dilemma he's leaving, he says, I am, I'm exempted from the, and the commandment of circumcision. My son's exempted from the commandment of circumcision because it would be dangerous to do it and then go on a trip. But yet he was punished for not circumcising his son. So why was he, why was he punished then? So, Here's the thing: the gamba makomsi kanat say lekayim It's because since he was in the category of a not of a son of Noah, therefore, even in the case of danger, he had to fulfill the mitzvah. Right? What we're saying is that for a Jew, a Jew is exempted from the mitzvah if it's dangerous. A non-Jew is not exempted from the mitzvah if even if it's dangerous. So Moses has the special commandment of circumcision, but since he's in the category of a non-Jew, since it's before the giving of the Torah, then he's not allowed to say he's going to push off the commandment because of the danger. What he has to do is do the circumcision and then go on, then travel. Because he's, he's fulfilling the commandment and he can't push it off because of the danger that will come after, by traveling after the circumcision. So... Um, so, so, so even in a place of Sakana. He needs to fulfill the mitzvah. So then um, there's another book called, another holy book called Chemdes Yisrael, 
that goes to great length to prove the Harambam lo sfir leikin. The Rambam doesn't agree with his reasoning. So therefore the Rambam concludes the opposite. And he says, no, a non-Jew is not required to fulfill a mitzvah even in a place at time of danger or a, a situation that would lead to danger, a, a life-threatening situation. Because, because the, the verse that you shall live in them also applies to a Teshev. Now, Ger is a is a Ben Noyach, is a son of uh, Noyach, that lives in the land of Israel and, and has forsworn Avayi the Zohar and, and committed himself to live according to the Torah as it applies to the non-Jews. So that is applying to a Ger Teshev, this concept of not doing something that a um, commandment in the situation where it's going to lead to life-threatening consequences. And also, it's permissible for a non-Jew to um, It's also permissible for them to heal with forbidden things that is not in a place of danger. So now, on the question that's raised by the Mizrahi up here, he asks this question, he answers it. He also holds that a non Jew is not given this instruction uh, or this application of you shall live in them and see over there. But Lee Nira, and it appears to me, so the Rabbi Shtaif wants to come up with a solution to all these problems about what's happening with Moshe Rabbeinu that's, that's raising all these questions. Is that Moshe Rabbeinu, when he was going to um, circumcise his son, it was not talking about his obligation. It was talking about the son's obligation. And the son, being a child, didn't have the obligation on himself, meaning he's supposed to be circumcised, but he didn't have an obligation to... He didn't have an obligation to carry it out. So since the child was not commanded to be to circumcise himself, so to speak, then therefore there's no issue. That he could go, he doesn't have to get into the whole discussion of whether or not he's allowed to circumcise himself, even though it's going to be dangerous to go on the railroad, right because there's no command on the child to be circumcised at that point, at that age. Meaning to say the child has to be circumcised at eight days old. But that's an obligation on the father. But the child, the dangers to the child, and the, da- the, the child is himself not um, um, commanded. So for me, himself, for me, myself, it's one question of whether or not I am allowed to do the commandment, even though it's dangerous, or I have, I'm exempted from the commandment because it's dangerous. But Moses is talking about a situation about his son. So the question is, is his son under an obligation to circumcise? And he cannot, even though Moses has an obligation to circumcise his, he cannot put his son in danger because the danger is related to the son, not to Moses. You follow? It's the, you ha- it, it, it ha- it's the, the person who's doing the commandment and exempt from the commandment and has to be the same person who's in danger, according to, according to what he's saying over here. And since the child was not commanded, then the child's and but the child is going to be in danger. Then there's no question in the first place that, and therefore he doesn't have to be circumcised. He's not violating anything by not circumcising himself. Okay, so this now comes down to the question then is um, being addressed from two different angles over here. It would come out that there's opinion that really no, a non-Jew does not have to put himself in danger to fulfill a commandment and um and that moses is that, that you can't learn out a proof from moses is being punished because of uh that that he must have been punished because he failed to circumcise his son when he should have put his son at risk because his son was not under a command at that time okay next yud zayin so now we have to also understand something over here that when we're learning these halachas, we're learning it so we know what the rule is. For a non-Jew needs to know the rule. Like Rabbi Shtaif says, I'm writing this so non-Jew should know what to do. 
But also you have to think of yourself in two positions as a non-Jew. One is your own personal conduct. You need to know how to guide yourself and you need to know how to guide your family. So that's why you have to learn. But there's a second part, which is that the first of the commandments that is the, in the way that it's ordered in the Gemara and Sanhedrin is the commandment of dinim. It's of, of executing judgment, courts of law, right? So you also have, an, and every non-Jew has an obligation to make sure that justice is carried out, okay? So right now, when you are living in Germany and uh, they pass a law that says uh, no one, um, every uh, person who, you know, um, I don't know, flies an airplane, who flies to the right instead of the left when the clouds are in this certain level, you say to yourself, um, I, I don't, I'm not a pilot and I'm not working in the court system and I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a judge. So it's irrelevant to me, right? What do you need to understand the law? Because you, the, you've delegated to somebody else, you've delegated to the judges this, uh, this uh, enforcement of the law and they have to understand it to decide is the person was, is he qualified as a pilot? Was the sun, the, the clouds a certain level? Did he go right? Did he go left? That's all their, their, that's their job. That's the secular way of thinking uh, about law and, and justice. But the Torah says, no, you're responsible. Anything that's a Torah law, not a, not a made up man-made state crime against the state, uh, but a actual Torah uh, law, your obligation applies that you have to judge it. You have to be insisting and ensuring that there's going to be judgment carried out, which means to say, if no one else has the court, you have to create the court. You have to be the judge. So we saw before that the people of Shechem, in the time when uh, Dina's daughter was, uh, J Jacob's daughter Dina was taken forcibly by Shechem, who was the son of the king of that area, that the entire population was punished because they didn't do judgment. So you could have said, oh, one second. Yes, okay, there should have been judgment. There should have been justice done. There should have been a court proceeding against this man for having forcibly taken Dina. So um, let's find the judges. Let's find the police officers. Let's find the prosecutor, right? So the, the police should have arrested him. The prosecutor should have brought charges against him. The ju judge should have held a court hearing. And the, the judge and or the jury should have made a decision. Since those, since the data didn't happen. So, okay, those people are punishable. Pun pun should be punished. And Shimon and Levi, the sons of Jacob, they'll go in there. They'll find those people. You know, look up the address. Where's the police officers live? Where does the prosecutor live? Where does the judge live? And all those people should be executed for not, they, they violated this, this commandment to carry out justice. And so therefore they're punishable and they're punished. But if every single person is, every single man is going to be eliminated, that means that every single man had the obligation. So what that really means to say is that what was supposed to happen? The guy, you're, you're sitting there in Shechem. You see in the street that this man took, it's a public event. He, he kidnapped this girl. Hmm, that, does, that doesn't look right. Oh, surely the police are going to come and arrest him. Or maybe you heard about it from your friends. Do you hear what happened? Shechem was walking in the street. He saw this girl, the daughter of Jacob, and, and he took her. Oh, my gosh. Everyone's talking about it. Or you wake up the next morning, you read it in the newspaper, right? Or you see it on Twitter. You're looking at your phone, and you're like, Shechem takes Dina. Tweet. You know, there's comments going back and forth. Um, or it's on the, the, the news flash, whatever it is, comes across the telegram. Okay, so you look at that. So what's supposed to happen? You're supposed to say, oh, okay. Surely the police are going to arrest him. Uh, I don't see any police cars. I don't see any sirens. What's going on? You look the next day, you see that no one's done anything. There's no notice of arrest. There's no report in the paper that he was arrested. There's no thing on Twitter. It doesn't say police just raided Shrem's house and rescued Dina and take him into custody. So what's going on over here? No one's taking action. Well, 
then the next thing is, well, we better do something about it. Since the responsibility is on you as a resident of the Shechem to do it, what you were supposed to do is you were supposed to say, the police aren't doing anything, the prosecutor is not doing anything, and the judge isn't doing anything. So I have a, I have a responsibility at the pain of, of his own death, of his own execution for not doing this, he has a responsibility to say, okay, I'm going to do something about it. I am going to go and I am going to bring up Shechem on charges. So what would he do? He would say, okay, I'm convening a basin. I'm convening a court. If no one else wants to participate, okay, I'll be the judge. He's going to say, he's going to be the judge. He's going to call for witnesses. He's going to investigate. And he's just going to follow through. And he's going to say, okay, Shem, come to a hearing tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Now you're going to, you're listening to this and you're saying, what? Are you crazy? One second. Uh, who am I? I'm going to, no, but this is, this is the obligation that God Almighty has put upon every single human being. This is, this is what we have to take to heart. You see, we have to think of these things practically. Rabbi Steif is writing this as a practical instruction manual for you as a non-Jew. So what does this mean practically? It means practically you see this is not being, justice is not being carried out. You have an obligation to establish the court since there is no functioning court, since there was no court hearing, right? Now, if, if the court has a system where you could bring private charges, let's say the judge, you can go to the judge and bring a piece of paper and says, I want to charge, as they have in, let's say, the United States of America, a private citizen can bring criminal charges against another citizen. When the state fails to carry out the charges, the citizen is allowed to do that. So maybe that, that's what you could do. You could come to the court and say, uh, no one's brought Shechem on charges. I so-and-so bring Shechem up on charges. That's one thing to do. And the court might say, okay, we're going to investigate. You know, you fine. Then we're going to set down a date for a hearing. But if the court refuses to do that, then you have to establish the court yourself. Because the court is not carrying out justice. So now we understand that you have to know the laws, not just as an individual on how to conduct. You have to know the laws, how to, how to judge other people. How to, how to enforce justice. Because you have an obligation to enforce justice. So this is why I wanted to preface this, because we're going to the next paragraph. We're going to talk about people who are exempt from judgment. You have to know, not as an academic exercise, you have to know as an actual practical reality, is a person in a certain, certain uh, category, is he exempted or not exempted? What is the process? Who's, who's, who's committed the crime? So you, you're saying to yourself, listen, you're not, you're not uh, going to worship any idols. It's not a question in your mind. So, okay, so you know the basic ideas, but it doesn't really, some situation that you're never even going to get into what does it matter if you know the details the reason matter know you need the details whether or not it's allowed or not allowed is because you have an obligation to bring about justice if someone else is doing it so what we're going to talk about now is the categories of people who are exempted from their very status from the enforceability of the laws so the Torah recognizes that there are certain people who are not responsible for their actions. We said already that a person not knowing is not an excuse. If you don't, not knowing that the law is the law is not an excuse. If you didn't know that the particular person or thing that you're doing right now fell into the category because you, let's be spot the example, a man thinks that the woman is his own wife, it's dark, he, and, you know, and, and uh, he comes into his place and he, he thinks that this he's speaking together with his wife so he didn't realize that that's that's a mistake of fact but a mistake of law he's there's no excuse if he said oh I, he didn't know that it was not permissible to sleep with another man's wife that's no excuse he's punished and she's punished too so there there we learn that there's um we're learning that you're not exempted for not knowing the law but what about if a person doesn't have the mental capability to know the law So we see over here, Yud Zion, paragraph 17. We never punish from the non-Jews, low cotton, not a child, 
cheresh, and not a deaf person, v'loy sheitan, not a mentally incompetent, a f- sheitan means a fool, a person who's, who's in the category of um, an idiot, okay? An idiot meaning to say, not like your person that you don't like to cut you off in traffic and you call him an idiot. We're talking about a, a status of an idiot. He doesn't have uh, the brain power to know the difference between right and wrong. Lefi she'enam b'nei is because they are not in the category of b'nei means sons of the mitzvahs. They're not, they are not, they are not falling in the category of people who are under the um, auspices of the mitzvahs. A child does not know what's going on, right? You take a child, a child walks into a store, he sees a really neat car. Wow, it's a beautiful car, a little, little toy car. He takes it and puts it in his pocket. Your obligation as a parent is to educate him, to, to bring him to an awareness, to dedicate him into the service of God Almighty by saying that belongs to somebody else. It doesn't belong to you. We didn't pay for it. You have to put it back. You can't take that. Or you have to put it back. Or we t- you have to now go pay for it. Whatever the correct solution to that situation is. But a child on his own does not know the difference between what you bought for him and what's the store offering. And if he does know at some point, he's still not competent to make good decisions. So he's not going to be punished for taking that car. If a person is deaf, he can't, he, he's not able to hear, he's not able, he's not, he's not registering with him the what's going on in the world. A person's a shaita, a person's an idiot, mental incompetent, he also doesn't understand what's going on. We said before that a person has an obligation to know the commandments from his own investigation of, of what's going on, right? So these people don't even have, first of all, if you explain it to them, they don't understand. And second, they don't have the mental capacity. They don't have the, the faculties to be able to do their own investigation. So therefore, they're not, they're not considered responsible for keeping the commandments. He cites there to the Rambam in, in the 10th chapter of the Laws of Kings, second halacha. So now we have a question. Okay, fine. So we know that these three, three categories of people are not culpable, they're not punished. But what, when is a person a cotton? A cotton means a cotton means small, as opposed to a godel, which means big. Until when is a person a juvenile? Until when is a person a child? So until when, the discussion of what, until what point is a person called a child, is a ben child, ain't a mavur koka, has not so well explained, not so clearly explained. And from the simple meaning of the Rash, the, the, the simple language of the Rambam, it seems it's to be implied. It seems that a child is not, is, is, is sorry, is someone who has not come to the age of 13. We're talking about a man here, boy, has not come to the age of 13 and uh, brought two hairs. Hairs representing the stage of puberty that a adult, a, a human being, when they go from the stage of childhood to adulthood, is going to have physiological changes in their body. And one of the changes is that the first changes is the beginning of hair, puber, pubic hairs start to grow. So that's what we can know that a person is now reaching adulthood. So the age for a Jewish child to become an adult is clearly established. It's clearly established that a man, a boy becomes a man at age 13 and one day. Then he is the age in combination with the signs of puberty now bring him to the state of manhood. He's now legally a man and he's responsible for his actions. A girl, a Jewish girl is age 12. Girls mature earlier than boys. A girl is now considered a woman at age 12, combination of age and uh, the onset of puberty. Now, 
Today, practically speaking, we do not investigate for the hairs. We just go by the age. Look at the birth certificate. If it's 13 years and one day, that's it. The person's considered an adult. There's no, in the, in the original application of this, there was, it was a real question. Does, is the, what happens if a person has delayed puberty? Okay, then there could be real issues that, or the, the, the real issues that they're um, not really an adult. But practically speaking for today, that's not examined at all. It's not, it's not an issue at all. And the only uh, guideline is the age. But when we discuss it in terms of the uh, turning point between childhood and adulthood, we still talk about these are, these are the two criteria from a from perspective of, of creating the dividing line. But practically speaking, we only use one of those criteria today. So we see, for example, a boy, a Jewish boy at the age of 13, he starts putting on tefillin. The phylactery is the box with the Shema Yisrael prayer and the head and the arm. So that's just based on age. Starts, uh, there's different traditions, how long beforehand he starts putting on his practice and on his 13th, on his birthday, then he's now fully obligated in the commandments. Okay, so the, so the Rambam seems to be saying that um, it seems to be saying, applying this to a non-Jew also. That a child is at all, so long as a, he's not 13 years old and one day that's brought forth two hairs. So long as he's, he's not reached this phase, he's still a child. That's to say, in the case of a boy, a male, in the case of a female, from the time she brings out two hairs, and she is Bas Yud Beis, she's a child of a uh, daughter of 13, sorry, 12 years, and one day, um, like it's brought in the Gemara in, in the Talmud in Masech Taznida Mem Zayin, or Rambam in the second laws of Hilchus Ishus of relations, Halacha uh, Aleph. When is a person an adult? The Sefer Chemdes Yisrael Daf Kufiud Gimel. Hevi Mechachmas Mechacham Echad Shechida Shebenei Noach Ein Chiluk Ben Zacher LeNekeva. So he brings. A, there's another source he brings. That says there's a, an opinion that for a non-Jew there's no difference between a male and a female. And also a girl is not an adult until 13 years old. And he also brings a proof from what's written on a commentator on the Gemara in, a, in the um, laws of marital contracts. B'shem shita. Sorry. Uh, look over there. Okay, so it's bringing a difference. So we have a, a variations of opinions. One is that uh, it applies the same 13 and 12. Boy is 13, girl is 12. And another opinion, maybe it's both 13. But the later... Uh, halacha, later Jewish law writers and decisors, people making decisions in Jewish law, are kind of debating this. Since the um, concept of a 13 years old for adulthood for a boy and 12 years old for adulthood for a girl are concluded within the general concept of measurements, measures, that are halacha l'meish misinai. These are laws that were given to Moses on Mount Sinai. They're not explicitly said in the Torah. And um, so, and ayin tesis chadashim in perak hey me'avas mishnah chaf aleph shekasav that he writes akain v'shem shuvas harish that that it's, this is uh, included. He agrees with this according to the, the answers, the halachic answers of the, the Reish. 
And if it's so that the 12 and 13 and 12 year um, age uh, limitations or, or, or uh, time of, of categorization of people into child and adult is in fact one of these measurements that were given on Mount Sinai to Moses. Um, the, it seems to be that the, what the Rambam is saying is that the Shalom Nitna Shurim Elali Shobavad, that these measurements were only given to the Jewish people. So if that's the so, so, then one could say that for Ben Neach, the is not made dependent the um, measurement of adulthood of the age of majority, so to speak, the adulthood in the years and in the hairs. But rather, everything is dependent on each individual uh, boy or girl. If he is a ben das, if he is a, so to speak, master of his knowledge, of his intellectual faculties, that his intellect is complete and he is able to understand and have opinions, like ha- reach conclusions and, and have solid thinking. Then he's considered like an adult. So you, according to this opinion, since the measurements is an arbitrary um, decree from God Almighty to Moses on Mount Sinai, and it's considered in the category of measurements, and that only applies to the Jewish people, then if those measurements don't apply to the, to the non-Jews, then what would be the, what would be the uh, way to determine if a child is a child or an adult? It would have to be on something else, and the, something else is the, um, the question of his mental faculties. Is he capable and competent to think for himself and to reach competent decisions? Um, so there would be gradations. So it could be a younger child that's more mature and he's considered an adult. And you could have an older child that's not so mature and he's going to be still considered a child, even if he's older than 13. So you could, you could have a much wider range of, of what's considered um, a, chi- a child and an adult. Sha'az Choshev with the eye in Sam Sefer. You're a dea, look in the Chsam Sefer, Minchas Chinoch, Ritim Utak, the Sefer Shar Levi, Shem Sefer Shut Base Shlemi, or Chaim Shakasa de Inink, Kenyonim, the Arias Gam, the Ben Neach, the Inan, the Inan, Shia Ben Yugimoshana. So then he's quoting a number of later sources that say that even by a, um, that, that in the matters of, acquisitions because where where does this legal issue about age come into effect so we have we said over here in the in the beginning that a child is exempted from the punishment for any of these myths so you have a very clear understanding that if a child is a chi- a person's a child and he killed someone then he's he's, a, he's not going to be punished for killing somebody if he steals worship idols then uh, he's exempted from punishment so it's very important to understand what age is that going to be uh, taking effect. But the other issue is, when is he competent to make a business deal? Right? If, a, if you have a store and a three-year-old child walks in and says, I want to order, you go to the BMW dealership and the cars cost, uh, I don't know, $100,000, let's say. And a three-year-old child walks in and says to the manager, I want one of those. Okay. I, I agreed to buy one of these. Here's a down payment. It gives a dollar. Okay. Now that would be considered a. I'm going to come back in three days with the rest of the money. That's a contract, right? So that in in an adult, if an adult does that, it's a contract. He's obligated to buy the car. And if the if the car dealership said, "Okay, sir," the car dealership is obligated to sell him the car. And he could sue. He could sue to enforce. Either one could sue to enforce the contract. But if a three year old child does that then everyone understands that that's not a contract. The child has no obligation to come back and pay the money. And the store, the, 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 um, the, the BMW dealership has no obligation to, uh, can't go and chase after the kid and he can't, you know, uh, it's not a deal. There's no, there's no, 
it's interesting in contract law they talk about a meeting of the minds right so if the mind isn't completely you have to have a contract you have both people have an agreement their minds meet and on the same terms a child doesn't have a mind developed enough you can't have a meeting of the minds even though superficially the talk might be like an adult you could have a nine-year-old child a six-year-old child that could talk in a way that says i'd like to buy this you know walk into a store, give me five, I want to buy $500,000 of these Lego sets. Okay, it sounds real, but it's not, it's not legally binding. So when a person's a child's an adult, however, now he is, it's, his purchase is binding. So when we need to know when is his, when is he an adult? This is, this is practical, everyday, a relevant discussion as to, is this a valid acquisition or not? So he's bringing more recent commentators, uh, more recent halachic writers that say that in matters of acquisitions and the matters of immorality, then also a ben neyach, a child of neyach, a son of neyach, is required that he has to be 13 years old. So meaning according to those opinions that an 11-year-old that buys something is not a considered an acquisition and um or makes a contract not considered a contract and uh, same if he does something that's in a moral uh, relationship he's not culpable because he's under the age of 13. and he says furthermore look at the tasteless in um in the uh, of uh, Hulin, that he proves that really, or it's provable, sorry, from their words of the Tesis, that they believe that actually these measurements were given to non-Jews anyways. I mean, amounts to these, these measurements that we said were only given to Moses for the Jewish people, that the Tesis seems to be saying over there that it applies to the non-Jews also. So if, we, if it applies to the non-Jews also, we don't have an issue. It's 12 and 13. They can cause the prima godim, uh, Yeradea brings the source over here, but Reish Yosef Chulin, Am Veshut Be Shlema Hanal, Kos of the Ein Raya Yun Sham. But the um, another writer says it is, uh, there's no proof from this. Okay, so we'll conclude here, but I want to conclude on the following point. The practical question is what is the end result over here? What are, what are we going to say? we have to come to a conclusion because we cannot say we're leaving this open-ended, right? Here you are obligated to follow these rules. You have to teach your children what the uh, consequences of their actions are. When are they considered an adult? And you also have to understand that um, not only do you have to do that, but you have to, you have to act as a, you have to make sure justice is enforced. So we said about Shechem that you have an obligation. So there's Shechem, there's no question. He's a, he's a full-sized man. He's uh, 26 years old or 33 years old or whatever it is. You don't have an issue here. It's clearly he's culpable. But your obligation is to say, okay, you saw now a, a um, 12-year-old kid doing something. Do you have to bring him up on charges? What's his punishment? So you have to know the answer. So this is an example of where you can see that the, 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 the way of getting to the truth is, is we are debating what is the application of this. And there's an opinion like this and there's an opinion like that. But if we leave it solely in the debate, then we are going to actually, we're leaving, we're leaving the world in chaos. And not only we're we leaving the world in the chaos, but the Jewish person, is now getting stuck in the in the doubt because he's coming along. Oh, could I make a class for a non-Jew? I need to teach the non-Jewish person the Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Noach. But I don't know the answer to this question. This is an unresolved issue. And it's kind of an, an obvious question. So a person's going to say, I don't know how to resolve this question. I'm going to be giving a class and a non-Jew is going to ask me this question. I don't know the answer. So a person is going to be shy. He's going to shy away from going out into the world and teaching this stuff because it's left unresolved. So the question is, is so that we, ha we have to come to a resolution. So the first point is, as to the Jews' reluctance to teach because this answer is not clear, 
we can dispose of that by pointing out that it, the answer, while it's important, is not relevant to his teaching the seven laws of Noah. Because everyone who uh, he's going to be teaching needs to learn it. We need to say the adults that he's teaching, oh, he needs to teach because they need to know it. And the children that he's going to teach are going to need to be taught because they need to be trained in understanding this as they're going to reach adulthood. So if he's talking to a 12 year and 12 and a half year old, a boy who's 12 years, 11 months and, and 15 days old, if there's an opinion that he could be an adult or he might be not still a child, it's not relevant to the issue of teaching him. And as if, if his father says to you, to the Jewish, te- to the rabbi, says, Rabbi, my, his son is 12 years, uh, 11 months and 15 days or 29 days old. Uh, is he an adult? And the rabbi says, well, there's different opinions. I'm not sure what we hold as a bottom line. Okay, so that doesn't make a difference in terms of the actual application of the teaching because the, the kid's eventually going to become an adult in another three days. You know what I'm saying? We don't, we don't have to get stuck in these confusions. So what I want to say is why, why is this important to say this is a preference? The answer is you could say, oh, just say what the answer is. But if I say what I believe the answer to be, or Rabbi Steif says what he says the answer is, he believes the answer to be, someone else is going to come along with another argument in another direction. What do you mean? How could you say that? They're going to say, look, the Rambam says that the measurements were not given to the non-Jews. So, um, so me saying, coming out with a bottom line is not going to necessarily bring resolution for everybody. And that's fine. You don't have to accept my word for it. But so why do I, I'm, so I'm therefore I'm prefacing it by saying that even in a state of unresolved, it should not stop us from moving forward by te- to teach. So don't use it as an excuse not to teach. Number two is, from the non-Jews perspective, if you can't get clarity on this because you hear one opinion like this and one opinion like this, and one says like this, and you're not sure if he knows what he's, his, his should go according to his opinion or other opinion. So the answer is that it also doesn't stop you from carrying out your personal obligations of the Sheva Mitzvah Ben Enoch. Why? Because if you are an adult, clearly over 13 years old and, and you know, have the mental faculties, there's no doubt that applies to you. So it's not going to, shouldn't stop you. And if you're a child listening to this and you're 12 years old or, or nine years old, so you've got to learn this anyways. And you've got to, we train the children from the earliest ages that they have any conception of of the difference between of who they're praying to and who's you know that there's a god in the world and and even from even younger ages than that we start changing tra- training children in the right things to do so you obviously tell your kid when he's four years old and he picks up a knife and he's chasing after somebody with a knife a sibling with a knife you tell him you can't kill him right you don't say oh one second i'm not really sure are you an adult or not um i don't know if i could tell you not to kill no the answer is you have to tell a child at the youngest age we don't kill. We don't eat the liver of a living animal. We don't um, steal. You're already telling a four-year-old, don't steal this from your friend. Don't take his scooter. Don't take his tricycle. So the, the practical difference between knowing when adulthood and not adulthood is, is not irrelevant for a day-to-day practice as, a, as an adult or as a child or as a, an adult teaching a child. It has no practical significance. Furthermore, the um, the the mark the marking of time for a um, of of adulthood for a Jewish man is significant because he starts to put on tefillin. He things become uh, obligatory, and he has to he has to uh, put on tefillin. Let's say as an example. So. But a non-Jewish person is not obligated in the commandment of tefillin. So there's no real demarcation in, in the event of a, uh, when you have a Jewish boy coming to become a, um, a, a bar mitzvah. If you got his age wrong, it would be a significant mishap because he's not supposed to be putting on tefillin yet. But for a Jewish boy, when he reaches the bar mitzvah, so to speak, of his age 13 in one day, 
if he's not all of a sudden going to start doing something that he wouldn't be allowed to do as a child. He's going to continue in his path of the service of God Almighty by keeping the commandments and all the details. So, um, so that's that's also important to understand the um, that difference. Now, that so what I'm saying is that regardless of how we want to make a decision as to or how how it is to be followed practically, as to whether or not when a person is an adult. The fact that there's a debate about it has no significance except in the following situation. The situation would be that if you saw the necessity as a non-Jew, you saw the necessity to bring someone to judgment, to court, over a crime that they committed, a violation of one of the seven commandments, and it was going to be a punishment as a result of this prosecution, then it would make a difference. Now, that is a very, very important place for this distinction to be clearly understood. And I'm not minimizing it in any way whatsoever. But on a practical basis, the number of crimes that are being committed that are coming to your attention right now for that would require punishment, but done by people that are 12 years old and, and uh, 10 months or 13 years and fit five days is relatively um, relatively small. So my point is that you would first get fine, first of all, understand what the laws are, be committed to fulfilling justice. And when you arrest a 12 year old for doing a crime, God forbid that he should do a crime, right? Now, unfortunately, children are getting more and more the criminal age is following lower and lower. So you're going to arrest the 12 and a half year old and you're not really sure the answer to this question, how to apply it. When you get to that stage, then we'll have a discussion about it as a practical discussion. Now, as judges will sit and decide as a practical application, how should this child be charged as an adult or should he be exempted because he's a child? So I'm saying, even if we quit, couldn't reach a resolution or we are stuck with multiple opinions, then this, the, the spectrum of places of of, of, of um, situations where this would be a obstacle to actually implementing something because if, theoretically, if we are stuck here and not knowing, then if you if you see a twelve year old, God forbid, it looks like a very smart twelve year old, and um, God forbid killed somebody, then we we would have a question. We say, whoa, well. well on one hand, there's opinions that say he's not 13, so therefore he's not an adult. Go home, child. Or we would say, listen, he's, he's intelligent. We, 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 so to speak, speak to him. We, we check out his mental faculties. Well, this kid really knew what he's doing. He's, he, he can speak articulately. He says he knows what's going on. So maybe he should be executed. If, assuming he's put on trial and he's, and he's found guilty, right? So... Um, so that would be a, a definite question that we would have to ask that question, okay? So that I'm saying all that if we are left in, if we're still left in uncertainty. So the reason I'm pointing all this out is because we have to realize the uncertainty about what the actual law is in this particular case cannot allow us to stop doing everything we need to know, do. We cannot hold this back. We cannot say, oh, there's a doubt. Therefore, I'm not really sure what to teach. I'm not really sure what to do. I Okay, we're talking about a very, very narrow spectrum. We've narrowed it down to a very unusual situation with limited application where it would come out as a practical, oh, we don't know what to do situation. Okay, so that's what we have to, we have to first of all, take it from the general cloudy vagueness. We don't know. So therefore we are all paralyzed to, well, there might be something we don't know, but it only has a very limited application. And if we can't resolve it right now, we'll have to resolve it in a practical way when it's actually a practical discussion. And we do see, by the way, that a lot of issues in Jewish law are actually decided only at the time of the practical question. And there is a... Um, there is a concept of the rabbi 
the person is making a decision, having divine assistance, but only when it's a real question, not when it's a theoretical question. Because when you have a theoretical question, then, well, the mind could think like this and the mind could think like this. It's not really, it, it's a fascinating question. It's an interesting question. You want to get to the truth of the matter, but it's not the same as imagine ourselves. We're sitting here on a court, right? Because you, the non-Jewish courts could also, if, if they want to include a, a Jewish person in those courts, as a judge, they could. So let's say we're here, those of us that are here today, we are on this court. And we have to make, or, or we're, uh, uh, let's say I'm a rabbi who is, you're bringing the question to. Now let's think about this, the what's, what's at stake over here. We have a 12-year-old child who killed somebody. On one hand, if we execute him for murder and he wasn't guilty because he was a ch child, we are taking his life into our hands. That's a huge responsibility. So now the investigation and the thinking of this is going to be a completely different level. It's not a theoretical question. Someone's going to die or has the potential of being executed based on the decision that's going to be made. On the other hand, we can't just say, well, that's a, that's a tough one. I don't want to be, get involved in killing someone who might not be, um, in executing someone who might not be really liable because well, the first of the Sheva Mitzvahs, the first of the seven commandments is dinam, is justice. I can't use the fear of having to be responsible for making a, a, a legal decision that could result in someone's execution based on my fear that it's too much, it's too emotional, it's too, too uh, heavy. And say, I'm going to, you know, okay, let's just say he's, let's just say, uh, let's just ignore this question. Let's just let him off easier that way. No, because the foundation of the world is based on justice. And if this person's, if this child's an adult, then he is obligated, if he's guilty, to be executed because the whole world depends on this justice. We can't start cutting corners on justice. I mean, to say, if we, if we execute him when he's inappropriately, we've killed one person uh, inappropriately, and that's a lack of justice in the world. But if not punishing him is also a destruction of the world and bringing destruction on the world, God forbid, and a lack of justice. And we violated the, the first listed of the seven commandments. So now you see the significance. You, you could feel, if you start thinking about the significance, I'm describing this, I'm feeling that the responsibility, the significance, the turning to God for guidance, the, the way in which I'm going to learn this whole subject and evaluate the different opinions is going to be completely different than when I'm, when I'm actually doing it as a theoretical discussion. So it could be that the proper resolution of the question is when it's actually a practical question. There was a question of, of um, there's a story told of one of the great rabbis in the last couple hundred years that someone came to him with a question, a complicated question. And he said, I, I, can't, I can't give you the answer. Something, something, I'm not, I'm not getting clarity about what the answer is. And he asked or he, was, he found out that the question wasn't even a real question. It was like a theoretical question. Someone said, what happens if this happens and this happens, some complicated scenario, and he couldn't, he couldn't get clarity, he couldn't get divine clarity because it wasn't really a question. It was a theoretical question. And his ability, the divine assistance, the siyata deshmaya, the assistance from heaven to come up with the right answer is, is, the, is uh, related to the actuality of the question and the, um, that then invests the person who's challenged with the question, who's now faced with making a decision to bring God's word into the world right now, right here for this exact situation. We have this person is accused of killing or, or whatever he was accused of, and we have the victim and we have the, the situation and it's now real. Now the person is going to have to come to, the, the rabbi is gonna to have to come to a decision and he's going to have to take in all the divine wisdom of all the generations into account to come to what the answer is. And then we know that the answer that he's coming to, if, assuming he's followed all the steps and has the right ruch, spirit of God, and he has the right, understands the will of God, and he's followed all the um, laws, and he's followed all the, um, like we talk about the six, decision, six steps of decision making, and he's followed all the 
nuances and he understands this and he understands the real situation and what is the real situation of this kid and how smart is he or what is his real age and all these different details, um, then he could reach a, um, he could come to a decision. So then, then that's something that we could rely on because it's not written in theory. So um, well, with God willing, in a future class, we'll probably get, come back to this and explore this more, but what some of the possibilities are and how to resolve this as a practical basis. Um, but we're not going to, we won't spend more time right now on this, but the, uh, cause I want, I want us to be able to accept that there could be a debate on something and, but it's not going to impact us in any way whatsoever from moving full steam ahead to bring the entire world to observe the Shabbat Mitzvah's Ben Enoch. Any questions? Okay. Very good. Okay. Um, let me stop the recording here.